yeah. I count backwards from 10 or 20. But yes, I can. Sure. We are, it's a team. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Andrea Keene, Chair of the Wyzetta School Board, and I call to order the Wyzetta Public Schools Board of Education regular meeting for March 8th, 2021. This hybrid meeting is open to the public and also live streamed on YouTube. The recording of this meeting will also be available on the Wyzetta Public Schools website. On Friday, March 13th, 2020, Governor Wells issued Executive Order 20-01 which declared a peacetime state of emergency pursuant to his powers under Minnesota Statutes Chapter 12, Emergency Management. This allows school boards to meet by conference call or other electronic means under Minnesota Statute 13D.021. Before we begin, I'll go through a couple of reminders for our Zoom participants. Please identify yourself when speaking. Please mute your, mute your microphone while listening. Please do not make use of the chat feature as this is a public recorded meeting. And in an attempt to ensure that all voices are heard, each board member will be called upon for all action items. Please feel free to pass if you don't have a question or a comment. Could the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Linda Cohen. Here. Sarah Johansson. Here. Juanita Lucky, here. Cheryl Pozine. Here. Cian Falconer. Here. Chris McCullough. I see you, I do see you, Chris. Um, Chase Anderson. We've lost the meeting on our screens. And Andrea King. Here. Everyone is present, Madam Chair. So, Madam Chair, we can't hear things. Sorry, I just lost the whole meeting for a second, but I'm back. Okay. Um, we're having trouble hearing Bonita. Um, I wonder if we can hear other people who aren't at Central Middle School. Linda Cohen, could you test your microphone? Yes, I'm testing the microphone. Can and we hear can't me? hear Linda either. That's CMS. I'm sorry, can anyone hear me? I can hear all of you perfectly. Joe, should we take a quick break and figure out our technical difficulties? Okay, we're working on it. All right, Linda. Yes, as CN said, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, and you know what? Now we can hear you too. We're in business. Oh, oh good. Great. Sounds like the Zoom side is working okay. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. All right, thank you, Joe. Um, Bonita, could you please call the roll again? Uh, sure. 
Linda Cohen. Here. Sarah Johansson. Here. Bonita Lucky. Here. Cheryl Pozine. Here. Cianne Falconer. Here. Chris McCullough. Here. Chase Anderson. Here. Andrea King. Here. All right, thank you, Bonita, and thanks everyone for your patience. Um, first on our agenda this evening, we have approval of the agenda and consent agenda items. Uh, the consent agenda items are considered to be routine in nature and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a board member or citizen so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the consent agenda item and addressed. Consent agenda item is to approve the full agenda as presented and the consent agenda items in board book. Is there a motion to approve? This is Sarah, I so move. This is Chris. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Could the clerk please call the roll? Sarah Johansson? Yes. Bonita Lucky? Yes. Cheryl Pozine? Yes. Ann Falconer? Yes. Chris McCullough? Yes. Linda Cohen? Yes. Andrea King? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, next on our agenda, we have reports from organizations and um, our uh, regular presenter, senior Sarah Cowell, was unable to be with us this evening, but it's my pleasure to welcome Tara Haas, who will be giving us a presentation about what's going on at Wayzata High School. Welcome, Tara. Is Tara here? I don't think Tara is here. Well, if she pops in later, we can have her give us the report at that time. Next on our agenda, we have recognitions, and we have lots of good news to share tonight in the recognitions portion of our agenda. I will pass it off to Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board and all of those tuned in for our meeting tonight. I'm Chase Anderson. I'm the superintendent for the school district, and it's my pleasure to convene the recognitions portion of our school board meeting tonight. As uh, Chair Keen indicated, we have a number of recognitions. And the first one for us this evening is to recognize a number of students for our Scholastic Arts Awards. And we have Leanne Jasper, uh, Wysetta High School art teacher on the screen here with us. I'm gonna read a brief script and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Leanne and ask her to announce the names of the students and the awards that they won. Over the past 98 years, the Scholastic Arts Awards have honored the artistic vision of students across the nation. Wyzetta Public Schools has a distinguished tradition of students who create and submit their artwork to the program. This year, 11 Wyzetta students won 22 awards, including six gold keys, eight silver keys, and eight honorable mentions in the Scholastic Art Awards. The Scholastic Art Awards are designed to foster creative expression by secondary students and to recognize and encourage achievement in the creative arts by offering visibility and scholarships. The awards represent work from a broad range of art disciplines, including animation, drawing, design, digital art, painting, crafts, sculpture, and photography. Congratulations to the students who have been honored as gold key winners in the 2021 Scholastic Art Award Program. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Leanne Jasper. Leanne, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you for having me. Sorry about that. Um, so I, I just wanted to add one um, thing that uh, for the Scholastic Art Awards this year, in particular, I felt it was uh, extremely important that our youth were able to create during a global pandemic. And I wanted to note that they're, they're being recognized out of over 320,000 nationwide submissions and that all gold key entries are automatically considered for national awards with possibility of scholarships. And that ceremony will take place in June at Carnegie Hall. So, 
Okay, so am I to, um, are you showing a slideshow? There we go, thank you, thank you. And so I'd like to introduce Kylie Decker for her, her gold key for the mug of monstrosity made of ceramic and glass. And Kylie, I noticed you were here this evening, so we could, um, I don't know if we can see you, maybe you could wave to the audience. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your hard work, it really paid off. Next is Sophia Fossland for her abstract self. And this was made under the category of design. Sierra Johnson for her gold key for my cardboard self. So a sculpture made of cardboard. Also Sierra Johnson, my big brother for drawing in illustration gold key. This is we also, this, yep. we also have Olivia Wen, grade eight, Central Middle School, Euphoria, drawing and illustration. And the second award for her, uh, again, grade eight, Central Middle School, Ruminate, again, in the category of drawing and illustration. Leanne, I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, I just wanna thank you again for having me and having the students uh, for this great honor. Thank you. Thank you. Your... Thank you so much for being here and students, congratulations. Yes. Keep up the great Congratulations. Thank you. Now, re next recognition this evening is uh, we uh, have a practice of recognizing those individuals who have announced their retirement since the last meeting. And uh, tonight we have one person on that list and that is Janet Miller paraprofessional special services for 32 years. And I don't believe Janet is on the uh, meeting tonight, but we would like to thank her and wish her well and uh, let her know how much we appreciate all of the uh, wonderful efforts and contributions she's made to the school district. And our next recognition is for uh, Wyzetta High School Employee of the Month. And I'd like to recognize Marlene DeMarais. And I know she's on the screen. I've seen her uh, uh, earlier. And uh, Marlene, we welcome you and we congratulate you. I'm gonna read a brief script in regard to your recognition and then give you an opportunity to share a few thoughts if you'd like to do so. Marlene DeMarais is an incredible gift to the students she works with. The Wyzetta High School Special Education Department and to the high school as a whole. Marlene is dependable, knowledgeable, kind, and caring. She has served as a mentor for most new special education staff over the years and has been a tremendous support to them. She makes herself available on nights and weekends to guide and support their growth as new teachers to the district. She always puts students' needs first. Marlene builds meaningful and positive relationships with students, families, and colleagues. We are fortunate to have Marlene on our team and are excited to recognize her leadership and hard work as employee of the month. Thank you, Marlene, for everything you have done and the amazing work you continue to do. We appreciate you. Marlene, it's your opportunity to share a few words if you'd like. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. And, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm Marlene Deemaray. Um, I am a special ed teacher at the high school. And thank you so much for this great recognition. I'm truly humbled and honored to have been chosen employee of the month for Wayzata High School. What a privilege it has been to work in this district, this outstanding district for so many years. I will never forget um, when I was hired by Wayzata Schools after having been a paraprofessional for 18 years, I felt so honored and proud to be given an opportunity to, con to continue working for Wayzata. It has been a pleasure to work with my students. I truly love all of them. Um, it's been amazing to guide them and they really truly are the ones that deserve the credit for making me the teacher I am today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marlene, and thanks for joining us tonight. Keep up the great work and we appreciate you. everything that you do. 
And our next and final recognition this evening is uh, somewhat hot off the press and that we're uh, fortunate to have the Minnesota High School Principal of the Year as part of our team. Scott Gengler was selected as the Minnesota High School Principal of the Year. Scott, congratulations. I'm gonna read a script and then you'll have an opportunity to share a few thoughts if you'd like to do so. Scott Gengler has been a school administrator for 20 years and served as Wyzetta High School principal for the past seven years. He considers school culture to be his greatest responsibility and that culture is shaped by the school's purpose. Wyzetta High School's focus is that every student graduate, graduate is prepared for post-secondary success regardless of race, class, gender, or ability. The purpose has become known as the Wyzetta Promise over Scott's tenure. The promise is a commitment shared by all staff to ensure that each student is afforded an opportunity to learn and grow in a safe, secure, nurturing, and supportive environment. We're here for you is part of the school's motto. Scott has fostered innovation and creativity by creating the WHS Hub, this user-friendly, student-focused web-based tool that helps staff communicate, innovate, and collaborate. In 2019, the Wyzetta Hub was awarded a Local Government Innovation Award by the University of Minnesota Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Students share that the creation of the Honors Mentor Connection greatly impacted their learning. HMC is a class that allows students to pursue research in a field that interests them and are instructed on how to reach out to principal investigators at local labs and colleges to seek a research position. Staff share that Scott's core belief is that each and every student deserves an opportunity to thrive and staff are encouraged to develop learning opportunities that immerse students in hands-on and real world learning. Mr. Gangler realizes our school's role in society's broader network of, for students and he seeks opportunities for staff and students to plug into that network. An initiative that has impacted many learners at Wyzetta is that of the Courageous Conversations. Scott sought ways to amplify student and staff voices on a variety of issues, both in and out of the school. These monthly meetings give students, teachers, and staff an opportunity to see and hear each other in ways that break down communication barriers and the constraints of an academically packed, skills-driven class session. This initiative moved some teachers to tears and to action because of the honesty and insight of student voices. We congratulate Scott and I would just like to uh, say thank you, Scott, for all of your hard work. I know uh, being a high school principal and a principal at all levels is incredibly difficult work, probably uh, never more than in the current school year, the last 12 months. And uh, uh, it's just been incredible with uh, all of the, the changes to the learning models and all of the, the additional duties that have uh, found their way to Scott's plate and all of the principals across the district. But Scott, we're real proud of your work and we appreciate so much everything that you do for our students and, and staff at the high school and uh, the families in our community. And at this time, I'd like to uh, give you an opportunity to say a few words if you'd like to. Superintendent Anderson, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you. Uh, to be honest, it was uh, quite unexpected and, and uh, a bit humbling to say the least. I feel like I'm getting credit for a lot of other people's really creative thought and, and hard work. Uh, I've been telling people that in order to do this job and to do it well, it, it really does take a village. And I'm just super fortunate to be a part of the Wyzetta Village and, and uh, to be surrounded by uh, incredibly talented people in a highly supportive community. So uh, it's an honor and a privilege to represent Wyzetta High School and the staff here over the next year as the representative high school principal from the state of Minnesota. Uh, so again, thank you very much. I, I, I do, I truly appreciate the recognition. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Good work. And Madam Chair, I believe that concludes our recognition part of the agenda tonight. Thank you, and uh, congratulations, Principal Gangler. A very exciting award and well-deserved. Next on our agenda, we have the audience opportunity to uh, address the school board. This section of the agenda provides an opportunity for members of the audience to address the school board, and speakers will be allotted approximately three minutes. Please note that this time is allotted for the presentation of audience comments only, and no board discussion or debate will follow comments. 
Members of our community who wish to remain distanced and still make public comments may email them to ashley.winter at wisettaschools.org and the school board chair will read the comments aloud during the teleconference meeting. Do we have any audience members who would like to address the board this evening? All right, we do not, thank you. Okay, next on our agenda, we have administrative reports and recommendations. I will turn it back over to Dr. Anderson to introduce our community outbound distance survey results. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, we have a brief presentation. I'm gonna show a few slides uh, in regard to uh, the current uh, pandemic metrics, just to kind of track a little bit. I've been doing that uh, at each one of our meetings to give you an opportunity to see what the, the latest uh, numbers are in Hennepin County and local communities. And I have uh, kind of an abbreviated um, presentation tonight. And then uh, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Johnson, who will uh, give a few brief updates about uh, all three levels, uh, 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 specifically elementary, middle school, and high school. So to start with, um, get my slide to advance here, pardon the delay. You know, all kinds of technology uh, circumstances here tonight. So I, uh, you, uh, those of you who have been tuning into the board meetings, and I know uh, school board members have seen these each time I've given this presentation, but I just wanted to highlight the current numbers and, and you can see a really uh, quite a uh, change here from back in December through where we're currently at here now in early March. And in general, the, the redder the number, if you will, uh, the, the higher the, the number of, of cases within Hennepin County. And you can see back here in uh, December, uh, we were at about 59 and it went to a high. You might remember when we were way up as high as 130 uh, a few weeks back from this. And then you can see how the numbers have continually uh, dropped off in Hennepin County to the point where the most recent uh, number, which really is a benchmark number from about two weeks ago is at 16.78. So I didn't share the, uh, the range of numbers again tonight, but generally uh, the lower the number, obviously uh, the better the uh, uh, viral rate is uh, within the Hennepin County. We also um, have a, a website that we've just sort of begun calling the Wolfson model, if you will, and I checked this again this afternoon. And as of uh, March 7th, the number was 18.4 in Hennepin County. And uh, as of March 4th, which was the most recent uh, number on this website, uh, the number within the footprint of the school district was at 19. So again, anything uh, working down below 20 is uh, all heading in the right direction. It's kind of leveled off a little bit now at this level, but uh, over the past, uh, you can see the, the steep curve here as it went up and then now has been working its way back down. So we're in a pretty good place right now. We track this regularly and uh, uh, each Thursday, uh, these new numbers come out. This represents a, a series of data from this uh, communities that comprise the school district. So um, any uh, community that has over 10,000 residents uh, kind of has its own number, so to speak. So we track Maple Grove, Minnetonka and Plymouth. And again, if you look out here, you can see that those numbers are in a pretty good place right now in the mid teens. And uh, when looking at uh, the Northwest suburban communities that are kind of in the Northwest perimeter of our school district, it's right at 20 and then a little bit higher to the West and the South at uh, 22.3. So the average of all of these is at about 18. And uh, again, you can see that that's down from an average back in December of about 47. Uh, the next slide shows uh, the percentage of new cases reported. So again, the further back you go, um, new cases uh, in December were up about 3%. You can see how those uh, numbers have trended down there at, at about a 1% increase now in both Hennepin County and statewide. So much better than uh, when we were uh, at the peak earlier in the year. And then we also track uh, the numbers for uh, various age groups. So these are what I oftentimes uh, would call uh, general school age students and they're categorized by preschool or pre-K 
elementary, middle, and high school, and then this is sort of the average of all of them. So it shows uh, the percentage of increase from week to week uh, in new cases. So again, back in December, uh, new cases were in that three to four range, and now they're all kind of between one and one and a half uh, or two percent. So between one and two percent new cases uh, each week. So I like to share those numbers just so that uh, we kind of keep a running total and it gives you a visual for uh, the, the uh, trend lines and, and uh, for many weeks now they've been trending downward and uh, kind of plateaued at this level. So we continue to have a number of teams that monitor all of this and uh, meet regularly and discuss our learning models, it includes our uh, cabinet or SLT strategy leadership team, we have an incident command team our larger group of leadership council, which includes principals and all of our program supervisors. Of course, school board members and committees and their involvement with uh, various groups, um, leaders from our employee groups. And then we uh, uh, meet with our liaison parents, uh, which represents all of our schools in the district monthly. And we have a meeting this Thursday night and they've been instrumental in giving us parental feedback. And then of course, formal and informal feedback from our students as well. So that's the uh, information that I wanted to share with you uh, this evening. And uh, at this time, I would like to ask Dr. Johnson to uh, please give us uh, some updates on uh, the different learning models and, and how things are going. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Anderson. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, I have a brief update for you. Uh, I think we're we're very pleased with our transition to bringing students back for uh, on-site learning. Um, our elementary has been back uh, the for the most amount of time. Um, I feel like we're sort of hitting our stride uh, with the elementary group and uh, really feel like students have uh, made quite a good transition to settling in and uh, just reacclimating themselves to to what school is like. And for some of those kids, it's been a long time uh, from being in a classroom and some it's been a really long time or not at all. So I think the, the elementaries um, are probably feeling the most settled in because they've had the most time. You know, we continue to meet with the principals weekly and just address issues of, you know, how are students settling in, um, you know, just socially, emotionally, or, you know, what are we worried about? What are we seeing? What's our, our flow in which we address student issues? Um, you know, who are the go-to people that you need help from at the district level? Um, as you know, our resource curriculum resource teachers are a, are a great uh, um, resource for our, our teachers. Um, and so I, I think the, the elementaries, um, uh, really I'm pleased, I am very pleased with the transition that they have made and the progress that they're making with the students. And, um, you know, at Oakwood, when you go in and out of the building during the day and, and just hearing the kids out on the playground, it just sounds incredibly normal and kids seem incredibly happy. And it just reminds me of how important school is as a place for children to come, to come not, only, not only for learning, uh, but for socializing and being among their peers and, and how important the face-to-face -face experience is uh, for our students. And many times uh, people have asked, what's, what's the big learning in this pandemic? What have we learned about technology or distance learning, online learning? And for me, the, the biggest learning has been the importance of school as a gathering place, a physical gathering place uh, to educate children. So that has really been reaffirmed, especially with our elementary. Um, as you know, our middle school, we're still in the process of ramping up to bring the students back. Uh, Friday was a planning day. We have another one uh, coming up and on Friday. And, um, and then the middle schoolers will be back for full time. And I feel like we're, we're in really good shape to have that happen also. There's, just, there's always this anxiety uh, until the kind of, it's like the first is August all over again. And we you know, just need the kids to get back. And the high school, um, and I, Mr. Gengler's still on here, so I might just ask him to comment on the high school, but I know today was the first day that they had ninth graders back in the building. And for many of those kids, that's their first uh, first big step into why is that a high school? And um, I heard from a lot of sources, it was a great day at the high school and tomorrow all the kids will be back. So Scott, um, I don't, if you'd like to comment maybe. 
Dr. Johnson, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, truly was a fantastic day at the high school. Um, and it felt like it's September. I mean, the weather was great. The students were coming in uh, with smiles on their face. And uh, we're excited to, to welcome uh, all of our students who are able uh, to be back in the building uh, tomorrow. So we'll have a full uh, range of students, 9 through 12, in the building um, uh, tomorrow and, and moving forward. Uh, it, it is a, a heavier lift. There's no question. Uh, uh, we have uh, for the third term, uh, as I mentioned, I think last board meeting, we're at 60% uh, attendance, uh, and then that'll jump to about 80% attendance uh, for term four. So it is a heavier lift for our teachers. Uh, they're teaching students at home simultaneously with uh, the students are in the classroom, and then other times it's completely separate uh, work and responsibility uh, for our staff. So it might take a week uh, for us to get our feet under us and, and really uh, figure this out. But uh, the kids are excited. The staff are excited. It truly was a great day. Uh, we are committed uh, to providing meaningful and relevant um, uh, 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 courses and, and experiences for our students each and every day, regardless of their learning. Uh, choice. If they're at home or they're in school, we're committed uh, to making sure that that every lesson is meaningful and relevant and, and it's a positive experience for all our students. Today was day one and, and uh, we feel really, really good. And we just want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to get our students back. Awesome. Thanks for the update, Dr. Johnson and Principal Gangler. Let me quick see if um, board members have any questions or comments. Cheryl Polzin. I don't have any questions. Um, my comment would be thank you to everybody that made these changes happen so that we can move to an yet another learning model. So thanks to all the hard work that went into it. Sarah Johansson. Um, I'll just say a huge thank you. I have a very happy and exhausted freshman at my house. She said she felt safe. It was wonderful to be able to see her teachers and be with her classmates and um, all accounts from my um, study of one was that it just was a flawless day. So thank you so much. Bonita Lucky. Uh, just a huge thank you. Uh, my son, ninth grade, absolutely enjoyed being back in the classroom and in the building and actually transitioning uh, with uh, classes. So thank you so much to everyone. Sian Falconer. Thanks very much. Excited our middle schoolers will soon have the great experience the littles are having right now. Linda Cohen. <clears throat> want to add my thanks to everybody who's pivoted so many times and uh, no questions. And Chris McCullough. No questions. It was a, a good report and I'm just, uh, I'm thrilled to have the kids back in school and, and trending, trending, continuing to trend that way. So thank you everybody for all the work you've done. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda, um, we have the presentation of some results of some community surveys, um, an outbound survey, a distance survey, and a community atmospheric survey. Um, and I think I'll hand it off to Dr. Anderson to make the introductions. Thank you, Chair Keen. Um, I would like to uh, just turn it over to Amy Parnell, who will introduce our guests this evening. And uh, we look forward to hearing the survey results and providing the board with an opportunity to ask questions. Amy, if you would, please. Good evening, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Anderson and members of our school community. It is my pleasure to introduce Peter Leatherman of Morris Leatherman and Barb Nickel of Barbara Nickel Public Relations, who are with us this evening to share the results of three surveys that recently were conducted to inform our work moving forward in regard to teaching and learning facilities and incorporating what our learning has been as a result of this pandemic. Um, again, to review, the three surveys include um, an outbound survey of our families who did not enroll in Wyzetta Public Schools and chose a different option for their student for the 2020-21 school year. The second one is a distance learning survey of K-8 families who selected distance choice learning or that model at the beginning of the 2021 school year. 
And then finally, a comprehensive atmospheric community survey of all district residents. So Peter will be presenting each of these three surveys. And then at the end of each one, both he and Barb will be available to answer any questions or have further discussion. And also feel free to ask questions as we go. So without further ado, please help me welcome Peter Leatherman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you, uh, be here with you this evening. And uh, I'm going to give you, you're the first school district, you get an additional bonus uh, because we just completed a statewide uh, that I ran the results of yesterday. And as uh, Dr. Johnson was talking about the importance of kids being back in school, not only do the school boards and the administrations realize it, but I'm just gonna read you this question. I didn't do a PowerPoint on this one. I have enough PowerPoint slides for you. We asked residents in the state of Minnesota, which of the following is closest to your opinion? The pandemic has proven that we can effectively educate students using more technology and remote learning. And in the future, we will probably need less in-person classroom time and possibly fewer teachers than we have today. 14% of Minnesotans agreed with that statement. The other statement was the pandemic has proven that many students need daily interaction in classrooms with teachers if they are going to succeed in school. In the future, we will use tech, more technology, but it won't replace what teachers can provide. 80% of Minnesotans agreed with that statement and 54% strongly agreed with that statement. So residents not only feel and believe what the administration and school board. So that was just a little side note when I heard Dr. Johnson mention that I thought I'd share with the group. So to get into your results, there's a lot of data here this evening. So let's start with the outbound survey. And let me, we don't have technology issues. We're gonna share the screen. Are we up and running on your end? Yep, it looks good. Excellent. So this sample was, uh, uh, we called parents who chose not to send their children to the YZ School District this past fall. So it not only included those that had children in last year, but kindergartners that were expected to attend. It was a sample of 155 uh, because you have what's called a small sample correction. Uh, we don't have to talk to as many people uh, when you have a, sa a sample or an N of less than 2000. Um, and so you don't have to talk to as many people in order to get the same uh, plus or minus. And so that plus or minus five is reflective throughout the course of this survey. The demographics on this one, 59% indicated they had elementary school children, 31% middle school and high school, it's 23%. The average time in the district was approximately eight years. You can see that 56% had been in the district for less than 10 years. There's, these are younger parents, obviously with the number of uh, households containing elementary school children with 40% being between the eight, ages of 18 and 34. Preschoolers were 23% uh, indicated they had preschoolers, 8% access special education services from the district, and they're very educated. 50% were college graduate or postgraduate, 39% some college experience, and 11% were high school graduates. 43% uh, uh, male, 57% female. What was their choice at the start of the school year to send their child elsewhere? 36% indicated they sent them to another school, a public school district, 2% homeschooled, 36% sent them to a charter school, and 27% did private and parochial. Now taking out the homeschoolers, those other three categories, we asked them, what sort of learning format is your student in starting this past fall? 57% indicated that they were in person every day, 11% were full-time distance learning, and 32% were in some sort of hybrid where they were at school some days and at home other days. What was the reason for their decision? Um, the reasons, the, the, the top two reasons, uh, it's in-person learning. Uh, they could tell us the first uh, primary reason and then a secondary reason. The dark blue indicates the primary reason. You can see 37% of, of the parents 
pointed to in-person learning as either the primary or the second reason, followed by socialization with 12% saying it was the primary reason and 8% saying secondary. Uh, we have a few more that hit double digits then and a combined uh, reason for the decision, the convenience of the location, faith-based uh, at 14%, good academics at 14%, and the good teachers at 17%. But the two primary reasons were in-person learning and the need for socialization for their child. How big a factor was the hybrid learning model that the YZ schools were going to uh, start the school year with um, in last September? It was a factor for 45%. 13% said it was the most important factor, 32% said it was a major factor, and the remaining 55% said it either was no difference or just a minor factor. This is the first change that we typically see uh, from outbound surveys. And we've been doing outbound surveys for 20 years. And what you typically see when you ask a parent who, has chose to, who, cho who chose to send their child to a different uh, school uh, format or program than the home school district is, they're very enthusiastic about that decision. There tends to be a bit of, you know, I would classify it as self-validation. Um, well, they're overwhelmingly 100% rated excellent or good. 39% um, rated excellent, 61% say it's good. Typically, we see that excellent rating in the 60 to 70% range because that's self-validation. You want to feel good about the decision that you made to send your child to their current school. What was the reason for the rating of the current school? Well, two reasons dominated. This was open-ended. They could tell us anything. 34% talked about the good teachers at their current school. Well, 28% indicated good academics. And then a, a, a series of, uh, of responses were in the single digits. What was their rating of the quality of education in the YZ school district before the pandemic? This is also atypical from an outbound parent. Most outbound parents feel negatively about the school district they're choosing to leave. This group, you can see 95% rated it excellent or good, 3% only fair, and 2% were unsure. Um, so they did not leave because there was a concern for the quality of education. It was something else, and as we've seen, it revolved around in-person teaching and socialization. What was the reason for the quality of education being provided in the YZ school district before the pandemic? Well, overwhelmingly positive, and what you folks focus on, and this goes throughout YZ, you're going to see this also on the community survey. 32% uh, talk about the good teachers in the district, uh, but you have 53% that talk about the academics. Uh, YZ residents, parents are have always been focused on going back to, I think I did the first survey in YZ in 1995, what is actually happening in the classroom when the kids are sitting in their desk. That's what's most important and what they base their rating on the quality of education. Now, just like other school districts, the spring distance learning uh, was challenging uh, for these parents also. 37% rated the spring distance learning as favorable, excellent or good. 34% rated only fair or poor, and 29% were unsure. Those were primarily the uh, kindergarten parents who had not sent their kids. They were supposed to send them this year. But that's what we've pretty much seen uh, across uh, the state, the metro area, uh, when we started doing surveys on the distance learning experience um, it, coming out of uh, the spring and what happened everybody was kind of split. It was about a 50-50 tie in the quality of education, tipping in some school districts to be more unfavorable than favorable. What was the concern with the spring distance learning? There were two major fa uh, factors. 33% said it was very difficult for the student to focus on school work at home. And that was more prevalent among parents with elementary school children than secondary parents. Then 29% talked about the lack of hands-on learning. 9% poor grades, 9% mentioned the need for in-person learning, 9% lack of socialization, not enough class time, and not enough teacher help. But two reasons dominate for the reason for an only fair or poor rating on the quality of education in spring distance learning. 
What do they like most about their current school? Well, you can see this typically tells us what the competitive advantage is uh, between their current school situation and the YZ of schools. And the competitive advantage is in-person learning. A third of these parents pointed to that's what they like most. Only two other things hit double digits and that was uh, the teachers at their current school and the current school was better organized. But the in-person learning is the competitive advantage and that's gonna play a role in what their likely behavior will be for the upcoming school year. What do they miss most about the YZ of schools? Well, at the bottom, 39% said nothing. And that basically is the group that was gonna make the decision to go elsewhere regardless. Every year, um, school districts have uh, parents that pull their kids. Um, what the ones that gave reasons for, 13%, it was proximity, the teachers, in-person learning, extracurricular, so, and socialization. Now the key question, and this is different than we typically see in outbound parents. The rule when parents make an adverse decision against the homeschool district is, once they're gone, they're pretty much gone. And that is not the case with this group. And we've seen this in other school districts now where we've contacted outbound parents also. You have 47% of these parents saying they're either very likely or somewhat likely to come back. 51% saying not to or not at all. What we typically see is five to 10% of outbound parents indicating that they're, they're, they're likely to send their child back to the homeschool district at some point. So, and, and we've seen this anywhere between 45 and 60% in school districts indicating, no, I'm gonna send my kids back to the homeschool district. And that relates back to multiple factors that we've already touched on. They're, they were overwhelmingly favorable about the quality of education before the pandemic, and the key competitive difference is in-person teaching. And with the expectation that there will be in-person teaching in the fall, you have half of these parents that are likely to come back. So I will take a break at the end of the first survey and ask if there are any questions. All right, thank you, Peter. Uh, let me run to the list and see if board members have any questions about the first survey. Chris McCullough. Uh, no questions so far, Peter, thanks. All right, Ian Feltner. No question, thank you. Linda Cohen? No question so far, thanks. Sarah Johansson? No question so far, thank you. Juanita Lucky? No questions at this time, thank you. Cheryl Pilsby? No questions right now, thanks. All right, we're ready to move on, thank you. Excellent. Now, the next group we talked to were uh, kindergarten through eighth grade parents who made the decision to send their child to uh, to put their child in full-time distance learning at the start of the school year. The question on this one that school districts were looking at is, um, are do these parents like distance learning enough that when the schools open up again, they are going to look for an online full-time option for their students? So that's the purpose to understand kind of the, the thesis statement we're trying to look at. The demographics of this group is very interesting. And it really does show that for the full-time distance learning group, there is a socioeconomic uh, portion to it. Um, you can see first, 49% indicated they had elementary school children, 35% each in the high school and the middle school. This is a younger group. Two thirds had been in the district for less than 10 years as opposed to the outbound parents. 22% indicated they had preschoolers, 11% indicated they had children accessing special education. You can see the education level is extraordinarily high. 63% were college graduates or postgraduates. And then you can see the age, it kind of switches from what we saw on the outbound where 39% were over the age of 45. It really came down with this full-time distance. Um, there is also the ability to have your child home all day with you. And you can see the gender split was 45-55. What was the reason for the decision to use full-time distance learning from the start of the school year? This was open-ended. Uh, and you can see we have four that hit double digits and basically take up 90% of this sample. Uh, once again, I forgot to mention this was 400 parents of K-8 students 
and the plus or minus is 5% on this one also. So we had 30% indicate that it was the seriousness of the pandemic. 29% said they wanted their child to be safe from COVID. 17% were, were uh, cautious or, or, or scared of uh, the district could close schools um, if they went back into a hybrid. And so they talked about it con with continuity during the school year. And 10% talked about that state had mandated an equitable uh, distance learning and, and uh, to be competitive with any sort of other lear learning format. Uh, and then you had a, a series of answers under the 10% uh, of convenience at home, consistent learning, guaranteed learning format, best choice for the uh, family and the child was doing well. Now, what was their experience with distance learning this fall? Very positive. 79% rate the quality of distance learning this fall as excellent or good. 21% uh, only fair or poor. You can see the excellent rating is one in five of these parents. Um, and when you think back to just the outbound parents and their rating on the spring distance learning, um, these folks had a, have had a very positive experience with distance learning this fall. Now, what do they like most? This is pretty much what we're seeing when we do these types of surveys also, is that the focus is not so much on the academics being provided to the child. It's something else they're focused on what they like. 16% indicate the child learns independence. 13% talk about flexibility. 8% the convenience at home. 8% continuity with education. Safe at 7%. Uh, parent-child time at 7% going all the way down. They're not so much focused on academics. What they're resonating to with the distance learning plan is the continuity provides and some of the, um, after the, 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 the side effects, shall we say, of distance learning with flexibility, independence, and those sorts of things. Now, what could be improved in distance learning? Well, at the bottom, you can see, and it pretty much reflects the number of people that said they rated it as excellent, 33% said nothing. Um, these, the parents that had something to offer, only one item hit double digits, and that's more individual attention at 12%. Uh, you had 7% each talk about socialization and teacher communication. Uh, this is a bit atypical. What we typically find in asking the question on distance learning and what could be improved, um, there's a, a normally in double digits, we find a, an academic rigor, more challenging uh, response, and then also more class time. Uh, simply, you know, in front of the computer, in class more, more often. Um, but overall, the takeaway here is that one in three of these parents there's nothing to improve with distance learning. The district's really done a very nice job with it this school year. And further validating it as a comparison is we asked them to compare distance learning this, this school year to last spring. 77% of these parents said it was either much better or somewhat better, with 26% of them saying it was much better. 20% said it was about the same, and only 2% said somewhat worse, and nobody said very worse. Um, so this is just another for, uh, validation and kind of, you know, going back to that outbound group of parents, if they would have had similar experiences this fall, uh, you might have been able to retain some of them, but you still have about half of those folks that are going to come back. What was their uh, quality of rating of the education in the YZ of schools before the pandemic? Even more positive. 50% uh, rated it excellent, total favorable of 96%. Uh, these parents were enthusiastic about the education being provided in the YZ schools. What was their key focus on uh, the, for the quality of rating? Well, 32% talked about good teachers, but then we have the classification that I mentioned about the academics. You have 14% say a high quality education, 13% talk about high achievement stats, 12% talked about good academics. So you had about 39, 40% uh, talking about what is actually happening in the classroom. Those just consistent from group to group on what they, they look at when they're looking at Wayzata and what that the key value is when they're rating the quality of education. Now, once they hear that the pandemic, the kids can come back and this is starting. Uh, this, this survey was done back in January, just at this, the start of the, of the move back. Um, how likely would they be to send their child back? 
70% indicated they were very likely, 24% somewhat likely, uh, and then 3% not to or not at all. So the expectation is, is that they will be sending their kids back. But this group does have an appetite for a full-time online learning option from the YZ school, school districts after the pandemic. How likely would they be to send their student to this sort of option? 26% said very likely, 11% said somewhat likely, 15% not too likely, and the rest were either not at all likely or unsure. Um, so there is an appetite in this group of the ones that chose full-time distance learning. Um, you know, approximately 20% uh, would potentially do some sort of full online option. It just works best for their family. Um, and, you know, and looking back, it's not only the flexibility, the independence being taught, um, it's less anxiety for the students and all of those sorts of factors coming into play. That's the last slide on this one. So I'd open it up for questions at this point while I pull up the other one. All right, thank you, Peter. Uh, any questions from Bonita Lucky? Oh, thank you, Peter. Any questions from Bonita Lucky? Any questions from Linda Cohen? No, <clears throat> no questions. All right, Sherry Polzine. Nothing right now, thanks. All right, Chris McCullough. Uh, not yet, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Cian Falconer. Thank you very much for the work, but I don't have questions yet. I am hoping to synthesize additional information and also then hear uh, Dr. Johnson's take on all this. Sarah Johansson. Thank you. No questions at this time, digesting. All right, we're ready to move on, Peter, thanks. All right, it's, it's a lot of information, kind of like being given a drink through a water hose, I think is the best comparison. And now there's even more. Um, and so with this, sir, this last portion of the research work, we started out and spoke with 400 randomly selected residents in the school district. The sample of 400 is projectable to plus or minus 5% in 95 out of 100 cases. Now, within that random sample, we had approximately 130 of the sample that were parents. So we then called an additional 270 parents. And then I pulled the 130 from the main sample, put it together with the 270 of the balloon sample, and now we have a parent sample of 400 that is also plus or minus 5%. The average interview time was 15 minutes. The non-response rate was 5%. And you can see the time frame from this survey was February 2nd through the 19th. Peter, you're not sharing your screen right now. I'm not sharing my screen right now. Okay, what did I do? I've lost the Zoom portion of this. Share screen. Is it? There it is. Yep, there? now we can see it, Peter. All right, thank you. All right, so th there's just the slide recapping uh, what I just mentioned. Now, if we look at the demographics of the sample, of the community sample. Get it to click. The average uh, time in the district was right at 10 years. 25% uh, each indicated they'd been in the district for five or less years or six to 10 years. You can see you have a third of the sample that what we classify as settlers. They've been in the district for over 20 years. 11% indicated that they had preschool children 33% indicated that they had children attending the YZ of the school district. And 61% indicated that they were empty nesters. And that simply does not imply an age. It just means the lack of presence of a child. 19% were renters. The self-assessed home value is right at about 325, 350,000 in that range. Um, the 
political ideology and the political party. Uh, this has changed over the 25 years of surveying in YZ, where now Republicans and Democrats are equal at 36% each, with 27% independent, uh, indicating they were independent. And similarly on ideology, 37% indicated they were conservative, 35% liberal, and 27% moderate. And continuing with the demographics, uh, the average age of the respondent was approximately 47 and a half years. 21% uh, were 18 to 34 year olds, while you had 34% that were over the age of 55. Uh, once again, highly educated as always in Wayzata with 11% high school graduate or less, 27% indicating that they had some college experience and 62% college graduate or postgraduate. Uh, one change from the past in Wyzetta, and this is a change that we've seen all over the state um, it, over the course of the pandemic, and it's gone up and down as we've had restrictions and closures and everything. Um, the financially stressed is up a bit. 37% uh, indicate they're financially stressed, 61% financially comfortable. Um, what we're seeing across the state, you know, when the pandemic first started, about six weeks in, we did a statewide. And we had what was normally across the, the state, 30% indicating they were financially stressed, that jumped to 45%. And then what happened in, during the summer is uh, as folks started realizing and they were telling us, and this question basically is asking people to line up their income versus their expenses. Is their income exceeding their expenses or is their expenses exceeding their income? And folks were telling us, well, I might have less income I have a heck of a lot less expenses. I'm not going on vacation. I'm not going to restaurants. I'm not going to sporting events or concerts or anything. Um, and so the concern that financially stressed category went down to about 40% at the end of the summer. After the most recent shutdowns at Thanksgiving, um, by the start of the year and with the uncertainty with the relief package out of Washington, D.C. Across, across the state, the financially stressed went to 53%. Now the statewide, I just gave you the, uh, the, the question on, on the value of education. Uh, currently that I just ran yesterday, that financially stressed now is back down to about 44%. Um, so as things start to open up, that causes less stress. And, and the key on this also is also looking at, um, you know, potential uh, funding requests in the future. Um, so it's not as high as we're seeing across the state or the metro area, but historically it's about 10 points higher than we typically see in YZ. Women out men, out, outnumbered men by 2% of this sample, and you can see the geographic uh, apportionment of the sample, 8% in the YZ or Orono area, 11% Minnetonka, 39% in Plymouth North, Corcoran, Maple Grove, and Medina, and 42% in Plymouth South and where to go? Plymouth South and Medicine Lake. Starting off, what do they like most about the YZ school districts? Now, this is everybody. And once again, what we have is uh, the academic quality leads the list. Excellent academics at 19%, high test scores at 17%, good academics at 8%. So 44% of the community is responding and viewing the quality of education through the prism of what's happening uh, in, the, in the time for the students. 17% point to good teachers. Uh, uh, hello? 9% oh, uh, point to the variety of programming and 7% broad curriculum. So about 16% are looking at what's actually being offered in the schools. But just like the two pre previous parent samples we saw before, the key factor is the academic quality. Now, what's the most serious issue facing the YZ of schools? Well, thankfully, going back to 2016 and 2017, we didn't have your number one response. The COVID pandemic hadn't graced us with its presence in, in those years. So now in this year, one in five are pointing to the COVID pandemic. Only one other item hit double digits as an open-ended response, and that's large class sizes. But now compare that to 2017, where it led the list at 26%. And part of it is just simply the kids have not been in school um, and if they have been, they've been in smaller classes where you have a portion of students full distance learning. The other unique item on this is down at the bottom. 
the nothing category. What we've seen, you know, before the pandemic, the norm uh, in the metro area of nothing was about 10%. And these are boosters. There are no problems in the school district. They're positive throughout. What we've seen during the pandemic is that number has dropped to about 5%. You still, though, yours actually went up from 2017 at 17% the 24% say nothing. Absolutely atypical uh, for what we've seen over the past six months. Now, in looking at the overall quality of education and what we've been seeing since January, as the kids started going back to school, um, there is, all the micro concerns people have had about when kids should go to school, who should go to school, all those sorts of aspects that I'm sure all of you have heard about um, has kind of gone away as things have started to open up. What people are more focused on right now, and this bears out in the statewide I talked about too, is at the macro level and what's happened to the overall quality of education uh, for students in the district because of the pandemic. So you still have 95% rating the quality of education as excellent or good, but you can see the excellent rating has dropped 19 points. Now, for comparison's sake, the 57% was off the chart in 2017. The 38% is still among the strongest that we have over the last 12 months during the pandemic. It's just the folks have gone from an enthusiasm to a good, not into the only fair or poor. Before the pandemic, the norm excellent rating was 20%. Right now, it's down to 13%. Um, and so this concern is across the state about the quality of education students are getting. They're not going though into the unfavorable. It's a hesitancy because now there's a concern about students that have fallen behind and how they're gonna get caught back up, uh, get caught back up. There still is an, overwhel uh, an overwhelming feeling in the district though, that compared to three years ago, the quality of education is still moving in the right direction. 47% say it's better, 40% about the same, and only 4% say it's worse. Now, some of these perceptions, and this, these are the questions that um, really will have changed. What they were in the fall is probably very different to what they are now. And this is what I'm saying, that things are settling down as you get more detailed and look at the atmospherics in the school district. Do they believe the school district spending taxpayers' money effectively and efficiently? No change from 2017. 70% agree with that. 25% disagree with that statement. Norm on that is about 52% right now. So it compares favorably historically and to the norm. The schools are a good value for the investment. Absolutely, nine out of 10 uh, continue to feel that way. Even you almost have unanimity now on believing that school districts increase property values for homeowners, 97% agree with that statement. A question that in school districts that did surveys in the fall and over the summer, are folks satisfied with the decision-making? Um, you, there's no historic difference now, 74% indicate they agree and are satisfied, 24% disagree. Um, that number now is in the other districts that have done it since school just, the school started to open up in January has come down to what their historic norms were. Um, you know, at the height of, you know, looking at October, November, uh, where some districts had 35, 40% disagreeing with the decision-making being made. Trust maintains 88% agree. Uh, up two points from 2017. One area where the district has done an excellent job and it, it was always doing well historically, going back to 2017 is involving the community in decisions. Does the district do a good job? 82% agreed with that in 2017. This time 76% agree with that. What's happened though since 2017 is that norm before the pandemic dropped to 75%. Uh, what began to happen was there was much more uh, discernment, shall we say, with people thinking about whether they could have their say or have their way. And so it was really this tight norm of about 75%. Because of the pandemic though, and really through no fault of any school district, 
it becomes difficult to involve people in decisions when you're doing everything virtually. And so the number now for the norm on involving the community is approximately 66 or 67 percent. The district really has done a nice job with however they've done with involving the community over the course of this pandemic. Has the district been honest about spending? Absolutely. 71% now agree. And one change that's statistically significant, um, and we're going to go into the reasons for this change, and this is the question is simply, I would support a property tax increase to protect my investment in the YZ of schools. 65% agreed with that in 2017, 25% disagreed. This time 62% agree, while 31% disagree. We're looking at the disagreement to look at the core opposition because we haven't told folks whether we're talking about an operating levy or a bond referendum. We haven't told them what the purpose is for. We haven't told them if it's 10 bucks a month or 10 bucks a year. We're only looking at who in concept is, would not support a property tax increase for the schools. And you can see there is a six point jump. The six point jump though, doesn't have anything to do with atmospherics as we're going to see it has to do with two major ways and they see the schools moving forward. The overall job performance ratings. Now I'm assuming with, uh, that these ratings would have been different this fall than they currently are as the schools begin to open. But once again, things have stabilized. The board is back to they were in 2017, as is the administration and superintendent and principals and administrators. The one thing we are seeing across the state and across the metro area is an uptick in the unfavorable rating of teachers. And in looking at that, it seems to be more of a macro concern. It's not amongst parents, it's amongst empty nesters. And you, you know, during the course of this survey in February, you had discussions in the news about San Francisco suing the teachers union, similarly in Chicago. And so not so much what was happening with the YZ teachers, uh, but this concern on the teachers union and the opening up that was happening across the country. Financial management is at the five year high uh, with 86% indicating that it's excellent or good. 11% only fair or poor, um, just an outstanding rating. The norm on this is 50% right now across the metro area. The property tax climate has changed for the better. Uh, in 2017, I didn't put this on the chart, it became too busy when we're looking at uh, multiple variables. Uh, the dark green on this is looking at the perception of total property taxes in the district. The light green is the perception of school taxes. In 2017, 62% rated their taxes as high, the total taxes. That's down now to 47%, a 15 point drop. Um, the average is at 51%. You actually this time had 1% saying they were low. And I always joke with the board at this point in time, I have their names and numbers if you wanna call them and say thank you. Um, but that 15 point drop is really important in the sense you go from, we classify any school district that is has over 50% saying hi, as saying that it's a hostile property tax climate. You have a majority of folks indicating that their property taxes are high. And the higher that goes, the more difficult it is to have a conversation about additional funding. So that 15 points and dropping the high under 50% down to 47% is significant. In looking at school taxes now, um, the perception on high in school taxes went up a little bit, uh, but part of that is because after the 2017 survey, the district had the successful uh, uh, funding request. Um, so that though comes in at 51% high with 47% about average. Now, the two key factors why there's a little bit of an uptick in that core opposition is the perception of need. This first question is, are the school, why is that a schools adequately funded? And we are seeing this in school district after school district uh, since this summer. We now have 71% indicating that yes, the schools are funded. In following up and finding out reasons why they think that way, there are a couple of reasons folks are pointing to. We went a little bit more in depth across the state that what I uh, previewed for you, 68% uh, indicated that their school district was adequately funded. Why they felt that way? Two reasons. 
first off, the schools have been closed. And so there should be a cost savings in the minds of residents that the district, the building, district buildings haven't had to be heated or air conditioned or cleaned or anything like that. So there should be a savings. The other thing that's coming into play is all the news that the school districts are getting money from Washington, D.C., from the CARES Act. Um, and so that really has put people's perception that the schools are adequately funded. So then if you believe that, you're less inclined to support a property tax increase. Similarly, looking at the building side of things and construction and the perceptions in the school district, do they believe that housing construction in the past five years has increased or remained about the same? 45% indicate it's increased, while 52% say it's remained about the same. Do they have the expectation that the housing construction will increase over the next five years? No. 49% indicate they don't believe that, while well, 44% say they do. So it's a bit of a split in what they've seen in the past on housing and what they view for the future. Similarly, on student enrollment, 41% think that student enrollment has increased over the last five years, while well, 51% say it's remained about the same. It's even more split on the expectation of whether student enrollment will increase over the next five years, with 46% saying yes, and 57% saying no. Putting these together and asking then, does the district have enough space to accommodate student growth? 63% indicate that the school district does have enough space. Down a little bit from the 71% that say the district's adequately funded. Um, but still, and you still, in looking at the parent sample, 52% of parents indicated they believe the district had enough space to accommodate students. Right? So that uptick in the disagreement has really nothing to do with the Wyzetta schools and its operations. It has to do with the perception of need, either for the, the adequacy of funding or the potential space issues in the future. What then is their overall tax predisposition? And this question is simply, if you heard the district was gonna ask for a property tax increase, would you be for any property tax increase, against any property tax increase, or are you for some and against others? Uh, we always look at the difference between for all and against all, and you're still positive. You have 2% more saying for all than against all. But you can see that it's a drop from the plus eight in the red bars in 2017. Uh, where you had 8% more supporting anything than opposing anything. And this goes back to just what I, I was talking about. Um, not so much any issue with the district, it's about the perception of the need of the funding and the need for space. There's still a tolerance out there uh, for future planning purposes though for facilities needs. I mean, your folks are willing to listen. 28% at the outset say, I wouldn't support any property tax increase. Um, and I always, you know, that number is manageable. Anytime it's between 30 and 35% is pretty typical in a school district at the outset. Um, so the 28% is on the low side. Um, and the let's make a deal question then, it comes in roughly the comfort level at about $8 a month. Now, school boards always ask me, is that number set in stone? It is not set in stone. Um, it is simply meant to be set up guardrails and to realize the further you go from that number, uh, the, the more chance of opposition. But to give you some sort of, um, you know, indicator, uh, you know, in the past, when you break down different components and ask folks if they support it and you have 75% of residents supporting a property tax increase for that purpose, you can go twice as high as that number. Some districts have gone three times over that number. But on the flip side, I, there's one district who actually came in under the number, but included a second sheet of ice and it failed. So it matters what's asked for on top of how much is asked for. Let's go to the parent sample, the parent balloon portion, and just talk about their experience this school year. At the start of the school year, what, what did your parents, uh, these uh, this parent sample choose? 69% chose hybrid, while 31% chose full-time distance learning. How would they rate the quality of education in the hybrid model? 89% rate it favorably, only 10%, only fair or poor. That, that's the high that we have with school districts that have tested so far 
parents perception on hybrid you have a full third rating it as excellent what do they like most 37 percent talk about in-person teacher interaction 21 percent talk about socialization and then we finally have 10 percent talk about academics uh, but the key factors on what they like most is that interaction and socialization for the students in the hybrid model what needs to be improved well, first off at the bottom, 31% of these parents say nothing. It's, it's working well. Um, those that focus on uh, an item, 12% said there should, they should be in school more days. 9% talked about more one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one time with teachers. And 9% talked about specifically more online class time. So when the student's at home, uh, they should have more class time. Uh, but there's really not one item that they're looking to improve in hybrid. They're just kind of fine tuning the dials on it. What's the rating on distance learning this fall amongst all parents? And now we did pull back and even the hybrid learners that the start of the school year went into this portion of the questionnaire because uh, of the going to full-time distance learning uh, back in November. 77% rate the distance learning uh, this year as excellent or good, only 23%, only fair or poor. Uh, norm on that right now across the metro area is about 62%. Um, the perception of distance learning from schools has gone up um, you know, from you know basically the, the tie or tipping a little bit more unfavorable coming out of the spring, but the 77% is outstanding. What do they like most? <clears throat> They're focusing on a myriad of things here. Three hit double digits, 16% learn uh, independence, 15% they're able to learn at their own pace, 10% the child's safer from COVID, 8% well organized and good academics and on down the list. Um, but they're really focusing on different portions of the distance learning on what they like. What needs to be improved? Once again at the bottom with 22% indicating excellent, 29% uh, said nothing. 11% talked about more one-on-one -on -one class time and then everything else was single digits. You know, and going back to what I mentioned earlier in other school districts that looked at the distance learning program, you don't have the focus and concern so much as the rigor and the challenging nature, but also the amount of time the student is in class while distance learning from a home. So then how likely are they to send their child back to the wise out of schools? Uh, once the pandemic is open? Well, you have 11% at this point in time over the, over the course, and primarily those indicating they had elementary school children say the student was already back. 61% said very likely, 27% somewhat likely, and only 2% said not at all likely. And following up with that small portion, we asked, well, what do you want to do? And they said, keep them in distance learning in Wayzata. Um, so th the parents are going to send their students back. The district has done an outstanding job in communicating this school year. Um, you know, simply put, this is in, in looking at the amount of communication and the timeliness of the communication needed for parents as they're navigating not only the week to week in the pandemic, but the day to day. 95% of parents said the district either strongly or said or, or softly said, yes, the district has done a good job of communicating just outstanding. Continuing with parents, how did they rate the district on six aspects that they've encountered during the COVID pandemic? What about social distancing when the students are in school? And this is from what they've heard or seen. So you have distance parents that are talking to hybrid and that's kind of all getting into the grapevine. Uh, very positive on social distancing, 91 to six. The cleanliness of facilities and buildings, 89 to two. Indoor air quality, 77 to six. Busing had the highest unfavorable, 67 to 17. And inside comments, what people were talking about was it's difficult to social distance on a bus adequately. 62% rated childcare favorably to 4%. You can see 33% had no opinion. Almost all uh, parents uh, with secondary school children. And then the school meal distribution, 89 to four. Uh, very high ratings over the course of the pandemic on these six aspects. Then asking the question that we asked those, those distance learners from the start, 
So we're including all parents now, including the hybrid model. How likely would you be to choose a full-time learning option from the YZ school district if it was offered in the future? You have 15% of parents indicating they'd be either very or somewhat likely. 16% uh, not to and 66% not at all. In looking at the differences between the, the, the three grade levels, elementary school parents, 9% indicated they were very or somewhat likely. It was secondary school parents, both the middle and the high school, uh, if they had high school or middle school children, 18% each indicated that they would be very or somewhat likely to consider a full-time online learning option from the YZ schools. We added a new section on equity. Uh, first off, we asked an open-ended and simply, what does equity mean to you? You can see that uh, three responses constitute over 75% of the sample. 27% talked about equal and fair treatment of students. 25% talked about an equal and fair education for all, and 24% indicated equal and fair opportunities to learn. Uh, those are the three key themes that made up over 75% of responses. We then read four statements, and I'll read them, and ask if the uh, uh, community agreed or disagreed with the statement. First, decision makers in the YZ School District support and embrace the community's racial diversity. 82% agreed with that, 9% disagreed with that. Teachers and staff in the district understand and respond to the cultural and emotional needs of students of color to help them be successful academically. 80% agree with that, 12% disagree with that. District staff have the knowledge and skills needed to work with a racially diverse community. 82% agree, 9% disagree. And then finally, school district staff reach out to community members of color in meaningful ways to seek input on school decisions. 74% agree, 11% disagree. And in this one, we had 16% um, that say that they were unsure. And inside comments, it kind of goes back to that question I talked about earlier on involving the community in decisions. It's kind of hard right now in the pandemic to get that involvement. And so not necessarily where people say no, um, they don't do a good job in reaching out. It's simply that they're, they're not aware of the opportunities uh, and with virtual, it makes it more difficult. We then had ended this section with the question simply, do you believe racism is a very serious problem in the YZ school district? 2% uh, said very serious, 28% total said at least somewhat serious. You can see 68% said not to or not at all serious. And amongst parents, Parents, 30% uh, uh, indicated very or somewhat serious. 1% of parents said very serious. The remaining 66% said not to or not at all. And then finally, going to a few questions on communication. And communication has um, methods. And on this one, I put up the overall sample and the parent sample because we've had uh, a, a divergence now, complete divergence in how parents and how the community whole, as a whole is getting their information. The bronze colored bar is the overall sample. The yellow bar are parents. What's the principal source of information for the community? Mailings at 25%. The web district website at 23%. Uh, you can see the grapevine is alive in Lush and Wyzetta, 19% indicating they're getting it from a friend or a family member. 12% the district newsletter, 10% district staff, 8% email. When we look at the parent sample, though, what's their principal source of information? It's the email at 28%, district website at 24, followed by district staff. But the true difference now is the what's the most effective way? How do they prefer to receive information? The community as a whole, it's still evenly divided. I simply look at this chart as print versus electronic. And you can see you had 38% indicate mail newsletter and 7% local newspaper. So 45% indicating some sort of prints in their hand. The rest, some sort of electronic. But on the parent side, you can see it's 91% indicating an electronic and with 59% indicating e-newsletter or email. And it really has solidified. And we've seen this in other districts too, in looking at the preference, um, the pandemic with parents 
has made it a necessity to use email as a conduit to receive information in the manner that's needed to make decisions, like I mentioned, week to week or day to day. Um, it really has set in stone the preference for parents to get that information from the district in that manner. That is all the slides. I would be happy to answer any questions people may have now. All right, Peter, thank you so much for all that information. Um, I'm sure my board colleagues will have some questions or comments. We will start with Cianne Falconer. Thank you so much, Peter, for all of that data. What does scattered mean? So, so oh, uh, scattered is, so when you see scattered, it's an open-ended question. So we can let people tell us anything they want and then include in the categories. And so scattered are simply idiosyncratic responses that don't amount to over 2%. If it's 1% or less, we just collapse them down into a scattered category. Okay, that was my primary question. <laughs> All right, um, I will let my board colleagues take additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Cian, we can come back to you if you think of another question. Uh, Chris McCullough. Yeah, uh, thanks, Peter, as always. Um, so I guess kind of a big picture question as you step back from the three different surveys and you've obviously got the benefit of having worked with other school districts and maybe even statewide data, when you look at our survey results, and I think on balance, we saw a lot of really positive um, you know, trends, if you will. Are, are there a couple of items, not to sound glasses half empty, but are there a couple of items that you would point out and say, hey, here's an opportunity for us to learn, get better, improve, things like that? I, the, the key, Ed, you're, you're not unique on this one. It, it's really when I talked about that overall rating on the quality of education and the drop in the enthusiastic rating, that excellent rating. Um, and while YZ is still three times higher than the norm we're seeing during the pandemic, this is an overarching concern, though, that's not unique to YZ. As people have shifted away from being concerned about the day-to-day decisions being made on operations, they're now concerned on that overarching and the focus, you know, one school district, we asked simply a question, would you support a property tax increase to provide more funding to help students that have fallen behind academically during the pandemic? This is a fairly conservative school district that we asked that question in and 91% of the community said yes. It, it, they're willing not only to invest in to, uh, to mollify their concerns on that overarching quality of academics. And so I think that that's you know, one of the challenges moving forward. Another challenge is going to be making folks understand funding. And funding, you know, I, I've been doing this since 94. Uh, my business partner was my professor at Augsburg. And one of the first uh, meetings I ever went to the school district is we asked a question on a survey. Do you know the difference between a bond referendum and an operating levy? In 1994, I had no idea what the difference was. I was 21 years out of college and hitting them up for an internship. And it was the universal constant. And we asked it for an additional six or seven years. And then it just came in. It was between 18 and 21% in every single school district across the state of Minnesota knew what the difference was. So it became, it doesn't matter. They don't know. Let's tell them what it is. Okay. Where uh, lobbies are for learning, bonds are for building. Um, but you have to now go beyond that. And especially you're going to have two, well, you have one major challenge I mentioned already, and that's the CARES Act. And, you know, I was on school board meeting a month ago and they announced that they got $5 million from the CARES Act. Well, that then goes to a perception amongst residents that the district has $5 million, they're adequately funded. They, you have to do an education piece with people to make them understand. That's one time. That's not gonna be recurring. That's not over the course of 10 years, like an operating levy um, or whatever that dollar amount is. But then also you're gonna have the legislature and the legislature, uh, after they do their work in May or July or December, uh, 
and they come up with the biennium budget on what the percent increase will be for school districts, um, I always call it the victory lap. And they go out and talk about how all the money they gave to schools. And that also is going to undercut the need that districts have um, simply because the, as everybody knows, that number doesn't even reflect the cost of living increases. So I, I don't think you have any unique challenges um, you have challenges that other districts are going to have. The, the, uh, the benefit you have is you always have been and you continue to be in a good place. You still have, and that's why you know, I pointed out in that most serious issue uh, question, we still have about 24% saying that there is no problem. Um, those boosters, that's the reservoir of goodwill that districts need um, to, to lean on. Um, and that helps alleviate it. It helps with, it builds trust with communication and information being shared, Chris. Thank you. All right, next we have Sarah Johansson. Hi, thank you. Uh, first, I just wanna say thanks to uh, Peter and Barb and Amy for pulling this together. And mostly thank you to our communities. There is such a wealth of information from our parents and our families. and. 15 minutes in a survey is a, a quite a long time and I can just see us using this data in so many ways moving forward. So a big, big thanks. Um, my question is going to build on Chris's a little bit um, and it might be uh, kind of a prediction question that I don't know if it's fair to ask or not. But um, in the survey data, we saw that our results from 2017 to 2021 in many areas stayed pretty consistent. Um, and as we're looking at making decisions moving forward and we start to dig out of the pandemic and um, look ahead, are there anything, is there anything on the horizon, maybe building on what you said, or maybe you answered it with Chris, that would make us think that community perceptions could change drastically? Like, is this a snapshot kind of of how we're moving forward or is everything on the table in a year as our world starts to dig out? and? Is that even a fair question to ask? It's 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 a fun question to posit. Um, you know, I, I, I everybody's probably heard me say this: surveys are snapshot in time. Okay, the current context impacts people's attitudes and opinions. Now, typically, with nothing major going on in a school district, that snapshot in time can be good for a year maybe even 18 months. If things are settled, you don't have high growth, those sorts of things. The pandemic has made it that the snapshot is probably good for 24 hours. Um, it's simply because, I mean, it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole. What's the issue going to be coming up? But I do get a feeling now and seeing the data over the last six to eight weeks that things are starting to settle down we're starting to get a sense of not necessarily what the new normal will be, but that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train anymore. And so you, you don't have these wild swings in public opinion um, that we had seen from, you know, the first surveys we did back at the end of April till, you know, the holidays uh, and, and the last shutdown from the governor. Um, so, you know, I have, I have some clients that are talking about going for a referendum uh, in November for either an oper operating levy or a bond. And one of the superintendents asked me, well, when would be the ideal time to survey the community on their thoughts on the referendum? And I said, the Monday before the referendum in November this year. I mean, the, the consistent snapshot in time is, is, is difficult to have. Um, but I, I, I don't think you're going to, unless God... God willing, nothing, nothing bad happens uh, with the pandemic where we start going backwards and cases are closing and schools are closed. I mean, you know, I don't want to throw that on the table. It seems like things now are moving in that direction. And that's why we see it when we're looking at those atmospherics. I, I guarantee you, your results were very different in September and October as parents and the community was adjusting to the decisions. Um, and that's the way we we've gone back to the historical norms. Um, and so I think that that does provide more stability and more that this is a, this is a snapshot of what people are thinking about. The, the, the key throughout this past year in a community, first off, there were two challenges every district had. And actually, I'll just, I'll say this with local government. First off, 
people weren't paying attention to local government. When the pandemic started, they were paying attention to national and state issues, what was happening with the pandemic. Then you moved into the racial equity piece over the summer, and then the lovely presidential campaign we had in the fall. And so when you ask people like those questions on how would you rate the school board? How would you rate the financial? You know, I think in your survey, you have about 5% of people saying unsure. And that's what it typically was in the past. In July, August, September, it was 20 and 25% in a school district saying, look, I'm not paying any attention. I've got all these other issues I'm focused on. Um, and so now they're paying attention again. They're engaged now back at the local level in what's going on in their community. Right. Thank you. Sarah, I'll just chime in on that one just a little bit. This isn't so much the perceptions and the survey results because Peter's obviously the master at those, but in terms of a data point, um, there's so much, we have learned that there is so much unknown right now and that things change much more quickly than they ever used to, that we can't predict certain things. And one thing we really don't know is what enrollment will look like in the fall. We don't know who will come back. If you have a distance option, who will use it? So what that will mean in terms of facility usage and that's, you know, that's obviously something that you're um, always looking at in YZ with the, with the housing developments, et cetera. And so um, that's something that truly until the October 1 numbers are in, you won't know what, where that sits. The other thing that I'd point out is the, um, the parents, especially I think it was in, in the outbound, they were um, younger than usual. And we've often talked about sort of the sort of the YZ legacy that people just know when they're in YZ that, that you support your schools. Well, as the parents in particular um, are, and I didn't mean younger, I'm sorry, haven't been in the district as long is what I meant. And when they haven't been in the district as long, they may not know that sort of legacy feeling, which is another thing that's hard to predict. Thank you. All right, thanks. Next we have Linda Cohen. Yes, <clears throat> thanks. Um, I'm wondering, um, talking about prediction and so on, if there's any way that we can glean from this information from the, the various surveys, um, a better reading on um, how many students might be interested in distance learning. I mean, we've, we've said that, uh, I think one of the charts said 25% of the students who are in distance choice now were quite likely um, or possibly would choose distance learning next year. Um, and it seemed to me across the board, we had maybe 30% of our kids in distance learning. So that could be somewhat of a significant number. And then you also said that um, one of the numbers also said that <laughs> about 18% of our middle and high school kids um, might choose distance learning. Um, boy, those are difficult figures to, to deal with and to sort of guess, you know, will they choose it or, or won't they? Um, any, any help in that arena? Sure. Let, let, let's talk about both of those aspects. Now, the 25% that said very or somewhat likely, that was the 28% of the of the folks that chose full-time distance learning. So that would net out if all of them follow through to roughly 7%, okay? The 18% that that included all parents, hybrid and distance learners. Mm -hmm. So that number went down from 25 to seven to 18% because you had very few parents that chose hybrid learning that were interested in a full-time distance option. Right. Now, Typically, what we tell clients when we ask a question like this, where you're talking about likeliness of, of, of uh, to participate or do something, there's always a discount factor because there's also there's the, you know, the devil in the details, moving from actual intention to behavior. And so what we typically do is if they say very likely, we'd say take half of the very likely and 25% of the somewhat likely. And that's the number that would follow through and actually do the, the whatever behavior we're talking about. Now, I personally think that this is a little bit different in the sense that 
um, you know, to ask somebody, you know, just to use since I just wrote a survey today for a city, how likely are you to organically recycle? If you've never done it before, you're going to do a discount factor once you have the details. This one, though, the parents have the experience with distance learning. And so I really would focus on the percent that say very likely um, that they would consider it. And I would probably, I'd, I'd be willing to say that you're going to have 75 to 80% of those parents following through because it's something they know they've seen their child's experience and they're latching onto something they like. The, on the other side, though, of the somewhat likely, I wouldn't even do the quarter because there's a hedge on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a hedge with the information of what full online distance learning looks like. Um, so I don't think the potential universe is at 18%. I think it's more tailored to what the very likely number is. And I, I think that was about eight or 9%, maybe 10% looking at it, depending on what it looks like moving forward. Does that help, Linda? It, it, it does help. And then, uh, of course, we leave it to the experts, the teaching and learning department and other administration to uh, figure it all out. But, but thank you. Yes, that was helpful. All no right. more questions. Thanks, Linda. Any questions or comments from Bonita Lucky? Uh, just a comment. Uh, thank you, Peter, for uh, the detailed information that you provided. Uh, and I guess my comment is that uh, from the survey, it uh, really was pretty surprising to see the response on the uh, equity piece to include the achievement gap and also the diversity statements and uh, very surprising to even see the uh, racism uh, follow up as not too serious. Uh, so I appreciate your point when you said it is a snapshot in time, whether uh, you know things happen to a person personally or whether or not they have awareness that it is happening or that is going on. So just my comment is that those things were very surprising to me to see that. Absolutely. That, 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 that is one issue that is absolutely a snapshot in time. All right. Thanks, Bonita. Any questions or comments from Cheryl Pozin? Thank you. Um, thanks, Peter and Barb, for bringing this information to us and helping us understand it. I apologize if I'm asking you to repeat yourself, but I'm trying to understand the slide that talks about how people feel education, if it's adequately funded. Did I understand you to say that people were factoring in federal payments from the COVID relief bills and they thought we were more adequately funded because of that support? Did I understand that correct? That, that is a piece of the calculation going in. Um, because what, what we've seen, and, and, and that, that question, I mean, we've asked it for years and years and years, and there's an ebb and flow. Um, typically in a school district, it's 45 say yes, 45% say no, uh, and 10% have no idea. Um, but we've seen this rising now. And, you know, so in the in the statewide that I talked about at the start and asking about um, the adequacy of funding. And if we if we if they said they were adequately funded, we asked why they felt that way. Uh, and the top two answers were the cost savings for closing schools during COVID and the federal CARES Act. You know, the, the district, the, the school districts got money from Washington, D.C., um, and they just they hear that dollar amount. And. First off, $5 million is a lot of people. I'm just using this one school district. I, I have no idea what YZ got. $5 million sounds like a lot of people. They don't even understand how large your budget is. Um, and then they don't understand operating levies and that it's over the course of eight years or 10 years or whatever the length is. Um, they only have the context that that sounds like a lot of money. And those two factors really do seem to be driving the, the increased perception of the adequacy of funding. Okay, so in your opinion, do you think that people are thinking of this somewhat differently this year and they're just thinking about this year, the current situation versus in general, are schools adequately funded on an ongoing basis? Yeah, well, they, they, they're reacting to the, the current situation as they see it. 
And like I said, with how this ebbs and flows, the key factor in the past has always been what the legislature does. Um, so that if you have, um, you know, back in the Palenti years, where you would have the Democrats go out and say, we didn't give them enough, and Palenti and the Republicans would say, we gave them a lot, and then everybody would scratch their heads and not know what was happening. Um, what we've seen, though, with Mark Dayton and then with Governor Walls in his first term is when you have basically the Democrats saying we gave them the money and Republicans are not going to say we didn't give them enough money, that kind of has changed the dynamic so that you now have more people thinking, okay, well, I'm hearing it from the state leaders that they're getting money. Um, and so that's why we have seen this increase. But this increase going from 55 to 60% agreeing that they're adequately funded now to 65 and 70%, that key change is the pandemic impact and then also the federal uh, funds from Washington, D.C. Okay, I'll just, I'll just add to that, Cheryl, um, just in terms of Wyzetta's context. If you remember all of those high financial ratings and uh, big trust in how you do financially and the fact that you had a levy increase in 2017. So they, you know, they think you're doing a great job and everything's fine. So, I mean, in a way, it's also a, a kind of an affirmation of how you're doing. Okay. Thank right. you very much. And, and the other thing that will impact people's perceptions, obviously, is when districts make cuts. Um, and so when cuts are on the table, there's discussion on budgets and every district has a different threshold. I, I say, you know, some districts, you just need to cut the skin and residents realize the seriousness. Others, you need to hit fat and others, you need to hit bone. Um, and so it all depends on what that tipping point is and how the cuts especially impact the education being provided to the student, whether that's increasing class sizes or whatever. That, that, that's one of the key things that can turn people to understand that there really is a, an inadequacy of funding in the school district. Thank you. No other questions. All right, thanks, Cheryl. All right, I only have one question. Um, and um, it's about the addition of the equity questions to the survey, I think. Um, I'm pleased that we're asking those questions and I think it provides important information for the district. Um, my question is about the demographics in terms of the diversity statement question and the racism in the district question. Um, is it possible to disaggregate those responses by race so we have an understanding of how different groups in our community feel about those questions? Um, is, do we have that data available? We did not include ethnicity as a demographic on the survey, but I would suggest in the future, we do include it. Um, the, the, with, with the percent of the, the, the ethnic group breakdowns of percents and everything, we'll have to look at the cell sizes because they will be obviously smaller to consider, but I do think it's something to include in future surveys, absolutely. All right, great, thank you. And, and it's great that we now have that baseline information and moving forward, hopefully we can add some more of that detail with the demographics, that would be great. All right, um, as we worked through all of that information, did any board members come up with any more questions or comments before we move on? Anyone, okay, any closing comments from Amy or Dr. Anderson? No? All right, well, in that case, um, just another huge thank you to Peter Leatherman and to Barb Nickel. Thank you so much for all the hard work that I know went into producing um, this presentation. And I know in addition to presenting to the school board, you're also presenting to different groups throughout the district. And so it's good to know that this information um, will be shared by lots of people in the district, leadership, administration, teachers, I think CFAC. So some community members will also hear it. Um, but thanks again for sharing that information, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Great. Next on our agenda, under teaching and learning, we have policies up for approval this evening. I will hand it off to Dr. Jill Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Attached in your board packet are policies and regulations for your consideration this evening. 
The policy and regulations were reviewed using the Minnesota School Board Association model policy were available by the teaching and learning department and other district stakeholders were appropriate. A final review was completed by the policy committee of the school board. Changes are indicated by an underline or strike through notation. The policies before you this evening are 517, student chemical dependency and chemical health programs, 520, student health services and requirements, 524, extracurricular and co-curricular student behavior, 525, solicitation of students, organizational membership, 531, pledge of allegiance, and 533, school start and dismissal times. The recommended action is listed below, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. The recommended action before us is to approve the updates to the aforementioned policies as detailed in the attachments. Is there a motion to approve? I so move, this is Chris, and I also move that we waive the second reading of these six policies and place them up for approval tonight. Thank you, Chris. Is there a second? This is Cheryl, I'll second. All right, could the clerk please call the roll? Linda Cohen. Yes. Sarah Johansson. Yes. Cheryl Pozine. Yes. Bonita Lucky. Yes. Cian Falconer. Yes. Chris McCullough. Yes. Andrea King. Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, we have finance and business services. We have four items on the agenda. I will hand it off to Mr. Westrom. Yes, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, members of the community. This evening, we have four items as, uh, uh, as you just mentioned. The first item is an informational report. It's our monthly financial reports. And enclosed for school board review and information are the following financial reports for the month ended January 31st, 2021. There's an analysis of the financial reports, a statement of our revenues, a statement of our expenditures, and an investment summary. Just a reminder that the school board has a finance committee that goes into great detail and looks at these reports on a monthly basis to make sure we're operating within our budgetary parameters. And as you will note, we did make some budget modifications and had the board actually approve those to reduce some of the revenues that will not be received by the district due to the fact that we've been in the distance learning and have not been um, receiving revenues for certain extracurricular and co-curricular activities, as well as for meals and in the community education fund. We've also been impacted by a loss of revenue there. So um, giving consideration to the fact that we are operating in a pandemic in a little different mode, um, all other items appear reasonable. I would like to just also mention real quick that you're probably aware that the month of February was had some extremely cold days and we did see um, some increases that were above projections in our energy costs. Uh, one of the things that our, our community can uh, be confident in is that we are bringing in fresh air, but of course when we're below zero, um, we need to heat that fresh air. So other than that, nothing unusual noted. And I do appreciate Sarah Johansson, who is the treasurer of the school district and um, other members of the finance committee who assist us in reviewing our monthly financial results. So with that, are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Westrom. Let me see if there are any questions from the board. Sarah Johansson? No questions, thank you. Cheryl Polzine? No questions, thanks. Sian Falconer? No questions, thank you. Anita Lucky? No questions, thank you. Chris McCullough? No questions, thanks. Linda Cullen? No questions, thanks. All right, thanks everyone. I will hand it back over to you, Jim, for advanced refunding parameters resolution. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, just wanted to share that, as I mentioned before, the school board has a finance committee and on a monthly basis, that school board finance committee engages our Citizens Finance Advisory Council, which is made up of 12 community members who possess financial expertise. And um, over the last several months, we've seen a, a fair amount of uh, variability in interest rates. 
that are available for refinancing certain debt of certain school districts. You probably recall that back in September, the school district did refinance or refund um, in the case of bonds, some of the district's existing debt. And we did save our taxpayers uh, several hundred thousand dollars at that time. So we've been continuing to monitor that since last October. And at this point um, in meeting with our Citizens Finance Advisory Council, and then um, subsequently meeting with the entire school board at last month's work session, we decided that it would be appropriate to seek approval to um, position the district to take advantage of certain uh, favorable interest rates if the environment became um, apparent and actually um, was achieved. So I'm not gonna go into great detail on the, the language that's included in your board packet, but uh, the recommended action that we're seeking is for the board to adopt a parameters resolution. And that really what that does is it gives the superintendent or the executive director in finance and business to take advantage on a, on a fairly quick um, timeline if an opportunity exists that would provide at least 10% savings to our existing outstanding debt on a present value basis. So with that, the recommended action is before you and you may read that at this point. All right, thank you, Mr. Westrom. The recommended action is to adopt a parameters resolution authorizing the superintendent or executive director of finance and business and any school board officer with the advice of the district's appointed municipal advisors to take proposals and execute the sale of bonds refunding the general obligation school building bonds series 2014A and the general obligation alternative facilities bonds series 2014B in advance of maturity, provided that the sale of the bonds meets all parameters set forth by the parameters resolution. The school board will meet at a regular or special meeting on the first practical date after acceptance of a proposal to ratify the acceptance of the proposal. Is there a motion to approve? Madam Chair, this is Sarah. I so move and ask that we waive the reading of the resolution. Thank you. This, this is Linda and I second the motion. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Are there, is there any discussion from Linda Cohen? No. Bonita Lucky. No, thank you. Chris McCullough. Uh, no discussion other than to say thank you to Jim and Mert and Jill and the team. I know there was a lot of work put into this and also for our finance committee, the board and CFAC. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Cheryl. No questions. Thank you. Sarah Johansson. Um, thanks. Yeah, I just want to underscore the, the thanks and appreciation. This has been pretty big project that uh, Mr. Westrom and, and Mert Woodard uh, worked on and Jill together. And then um, we have actively engaged our Citizen Finance Advisory, Advisory Council and other um, trusted advisories, advisors in the district. And so um, this does feel like a team effort and there's been a lot of thought and prudence put into it. And so thank you to our finance team and our CFAC. Thanks, Sarah. C.N. Falconer. No question, thank you. All right, could the clerk please call the roll? Chair Posey. Yes. Bonita Lucky? Yes. C.M. Falconer? Yes. Chris McCullough? Yes. Sarah Johansson? Yes. Linda Cohen? Yes. Andrea King? Yes, the motion carries unanimously. Thanks everyone. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the board. And the next two items are to approve bids for construction projects. The first one is a bid opening for the Wayzata Public Schools High School Roof Rehabilitation Project. And the um, bid opening was on Tuesday, February 16th, 2021 at 10 a.m. The scope of the project includes removal of existing roof systems and associated materials on approximately 68,000 square feet of district facilities and installation of new roofing systems as specified. The enclosed document lists the lowest responsible bidders and the respective base bids for the purposes of contract awards. Also enclosed 
is a detailed bid tabulation and a recommendation from CMD Engineered Solutions, who's acting as the district's uh, construction partner on this project. So the recommended action is before you. And I'll just make one additional comment that the bidding environment has been very favorable at this time. Thank you, Mr. Westrom. The recommended action is award to the bidders listed in the attached document in the total amount of $827,250 construction contracts for the Wyzetta Public Schools roof rehabilitation project. Is there a motion to approve? Mrs. Cheryl, I so move. This is Chris, I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion from Cheryl Pozine? No discussion, thank you. Sarah Johansson. No discussion, thanks. Juanita Lucky. No, thank you. Sian Falconer. None, thank you. Linda Cullen. No, thanks. Chris McCullough. No discussion, thanks. All right, could the clerk please call the roll? Juanita Lucky, yes. Chris McCullough. Yes. Sian Falconer. Yes. Linda Cohen. Yes. Sarah Johansson. Yes. Cheryl Pozine. Yes. Andrea King. Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Back to you, Mr. Wilson. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. And um, I neglected to um, thank Cheryl Pozine, who acts as the chair of the facility committee. Um, both of these bids that I'm asking the board to approve tonight are a part of the 10 year facility plan that the board approves on an annual basis. And Cheryl Pozine acts as the chair of the facility committee. So the second item is a bid opening for the Kimberly Lane window and door replacement and exterior wall rehabilitation project. And the opening was on Tuesday, February 16th, 2021 at 1 p.m. The scope of the project includes removal of existing windows, doors, through wall flashing, and associated materials and in the installation of new windows, doors, and through wall flashing as specified. The enclosed document lists the lowest responsible bidders, the respective base bids amounts, and the purposes of the contract awards. Also included is a detailed bid tabulation and a recommendation from ZMD Engineered Solutions, who once again is acting as the district's construction partner. So the recommended action is before you. All right, the recommended action is to award to the bidders listed in the attached document in the total amount of $343,446 construction contracts for the project. Is there a motion to approve? This is Cheryl, I so move. This is Linda, I second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion from Bonita Lucky? No, thank you. Linda Cohen. No, thanks. Cheryl Pozine. No questions, just a thank you to Jim and his team and for working with our construction partners that make sure that we have uh, responsible bidders and that great work is always done in the district. So thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Chris McCullough. No discussion, thank you. Sian Falconer. No discussion, thank you. Sarah Johansson. No discussion, thanks. All right, could the clerk please call the roll? Sarah Johansson. Yes. Chris McCullough. Yes. Cheryl Pozine. Yes. Linda Cohen. Yes. Bonita Lucky. Yes. Mm, C.N. Falconer. Yes. Andrea King. Yes, the motion carries unanimously. Thanks everyone. All right, last on our agenda this evening, we have board reports. And this section of the agenda provides an opportunity for board members to update school board members on school board related work or to make announcements of interest to the public. Tonight we have a board report from Cheryl Polzine. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to share with my board colleagues and the members of the public who may be watching a little bit about the work that happens outside of the two public meetings. Uh, with which we are all familiar. Uh, the board committees on which I currently serve are human resources, stakeholders, and facilities development and long range planning, which I'm serving as chair, Jim mentioned. I also regularly attend two district committees, the Citizens Financial Advisory Committee, otherwise known as CPAC, 
and the Legislative Action Committee, or the LAC. I'm also appointed to serve as a board liaison to the Minnesota School Boards Association, where I currently serve on their board of directors for Director District 4. Tonight, I would like to briefly update everyone in two areas, the Facilities Committee and the Legislative Action Committee. As the full title of the Facilities Development and Long-Term Planning suggests, we are continually assessing if our school buildings and other facilities meet the needs of our district and community. The recent addition of a building on Highway 55 has proved to be highly advantageous as it serves as our district's welcome center and provides much needed storage area. This past year, it also served perfectly for a food distribution hub as we provided thousands of meals to families during the pandemic. This location will provide highly flexible and useful space, perfectly located within our district for many years to come. As for our school buildings, we are continually assessing if we are right-sized at all grade levels and plan for adjustments as needs arise. Due to COVID-19 and the many disruptions to our instructional delivery model, we are currently close, uh, working closely with administration and the teaching and learning department to be sure we are accounting for effects of enrollment changes and possible expansion of online offerings into the future. Stay tuned. We are watching this closely. In addition, summer construction and maintenance is extremely important. Our upcoming construction season will see bond projects and long-term facilities maintenance projects that keep our learning spaces updated and conducive to best teaching and learning practices, ensure safe and well-maintained buildings and surrounding spaces, including parking lots and athletic fields. This summer, Plymouth Creek, Gleason Lake, and Birchview will see their media centers renovated, which will complete all the media center upgrades our voters supported in our 2017 bond election. These are just a sampling of the many summer projects that we will see. I would like to thank Jim Westrom, John Deutsch, Kristen Tollison, and many others who work tirelessly to keep the standard work going while also adjusting to the many demands that a global pandemic foists upon a school district. You have all done a stellar work this past difficult year and I thank you. Moving to the LAC, we are currently in advocacy mode as the Minnesota legislature is in session. We've begun, a, <clears throat> excuse me, we have be begun our Zoom meetings to present our legislative platform to our district legislators. I had the honor of testifying about a week ago in a house education hearing in support of public education, asking legislators to support adequate, sustainable and reliable funding for our next biennium and to recognize the many challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic this current fiscal year. We look forward to continuing the relationship building with our legislators and providing them with whatever information they need to make informed decisions to support our public schools. Anyone who is interested in possibly joining our LAC, please contact me and or check out the LAC page on our district website. It's under the community tab, then go to committees or go, go to volunteer and then committees and you'll find the LAC there. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thanks for that report, Cheryl. And um, I'd just like to thank you for all the hard work you've been doing to support the Legislative Action Committee. It's kind of the busiest time of the session when it's hard to keep track of all the education bills that are flying around. And uh, Cheryl does an excellent job of keeping track of that and um, really advocating for our school district. So thanks, Cheryl. Any other board reports? All right. Well, hearing none, that concludes our Wyzetta Public Schools regular meeting for March 8th, 2021. Is there a motion to adjourn? Mrs. Cheryl, I so move. This is Linda, I second. All right. Could the clerk please call the roll? Linda Cohen? Yes. Sarah Johansson? Yes. Juanita Lucky? Yes. Cheryl Pozine? Yes. C.N. Falconer? Yes. Chris McCullough? Yes. 
Andrea King. Yes. Oh.